brewmasters know this brewer's gold's the best cup from the vine. They brew it in... After these messages, we'll be right back. Say make. These were taken at the West Highland Police Station, 1984. You were there. Same model. World to sing. Sing with me. Who's that? Yo! You pick up the phone! Hello? Who's that? What's up? Follow Valley Mall. My dad told me this is the coolest mall ever. Revolving culture. You give us 30 minutes, we'll give you the world. Welcome to the home of two all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a revolving culture. Uh, you got the right <laughs> one, baby. I'm trying to find as many advertising <laughs> slogans as I can think of off the top of my head because today's topic is advertising in all of its myriad forms as it's appeared in our culture. Uh, it's it's going to be an interesting set of of conversations we're going to have about this. We're going to look at where advertising's been, where it is now. Uh, we're looking at where it may possibly be going. Uh, being that being advertising, being what it is, may go down some dark alleyways, just the, the nature of the topic. But uh, we, we certainly hope you find it as interesting as we do. Uh, welcome. We're glad to have you back. We uh, hope you've enjoyed the previous episodes. We hope you stick around with us for more because we've certainly got a lot more to talk about. Um, let's, uh, let's start just by kind of Anybody have anything really exciting going on? Is anything really key? Robbie, you mentioned earlier you had picked up a book that you were really enjoying. Yeah, I uh, about a month ago uh, while, I, while I was on a short little vacation, which somehow is when I do my, my best reading. When I'm at home, I'm, I'm beset by distraction and can't really dig into a book. But if I'm on a plane for a couple of hours, I'll you know, devour a portion of a book. And, and I, I've began and gotten further into uh, a book by an author named Neil Stevenson uh, called Seven Eves. And uh, it's, it's a sci-fi story uh, that begins with the, the momentous occasion of the, the moon spontaneously exploding for <laughs> no apparent reason. Like it does. And uh, it, it's... Was it because... The Rebel Alliance blew it up. <laughs> no, oh. no, no. It's 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 safe from the, from the uh, the threat of the Empire for now. Um, but it, but uh, it, it, the the consequences of the uh, the blowing up of the moon mean that that we have to uh, evacuate Earth and find a new home out in the stars. And uh, that's that's what the the book primarily deals with is the uh, the group of people who uh, are aboard the International Space Station, which becomes our kind of air sats arc for humanity in an effort yeah. to, uh, to to find a new place to exist because Earth is no longer habitable. Um, and I don't want to go too far into it. I don't want to get into spoiler territory. <laughs> yeah, just, just suffice right. to say that it's uh, it, it's been interesting so far. It's, it's very hard sci-fi in that there's not really any kind of technology they're talking about that's speculative it's all very you know concrete and it's it's like an engineer's wet dream because he gets into the <laughs> the, the nitty gritty of every you know uh, yeah. component in it but uh, um, yeah the, if, the if you Tom have the Clancy of sci-fi kind problems. of yeah if you, if you have the if you have the patience for a lot of uh, a lot of uh, talk oh Jeremy yeah okay. uh, when you said seven eaves I thought maybe it was a Mormon in the garden of eaves <laughs> garden garden of Eden's uh, wet dream not not so much. No, I think I think the title is meant to serve as a uh, uh, a metaphor for uh, the the women who uh, I, I haven't gotten that far along in the book yet, but uh, who I presume are going to have to be the 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 beginnings of a new civilization because we can't have babies uh, without women, and so these the, so, these yeah. these women are you know going to going to serve as the foundation for our our genetic legacy. And so uh, seven of them. Uh, no, I think there's there's more, but oh, I think okay. there's maybe seven primarily. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's been cool so far. But I'll, I'll pass it along to somebody else. I've I've had my piece. Yeah, <laughs> Andrew, what uh, what's been going on with you this week? 
Uh, beyond uh, watching more Shameless, there hasn't been much, to be honest. Uh, I did a lot of uh, podcast uh, editing and uh, did some website stuff, um, playing basketball. I, I, just the normal stuff I usually do. Yeah. I, in terms of things I've watched or anything like that, still the same stuff plug, I was doing plug, last time. through Shameless right now. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's been. I don't have much to say on that on that topic. That I'm sure. Jeremy, anything did. exciting going on with you? Uh, yeah, in the, in the indru- introductory episode, we talked about Stranger Things, and since then, my wife and I watched the whole series in, Ooh, in three nights. This, this weekend's got to be my shot. At it. it was <laughs> a fantastic show, very well written, just executed perfectly, captured everything that the everything that you want from nostalgia of that era. Mm-hmm. It just got perfect i mean you can go back i was talking with my brother about this you can go back and think about how good it felt to watch stuff like he man and Mm -hmm. all that stuff when you were a kid gi joe and stuff but when you go back and watch it today it's not how you you don't feel the same way about it yeah you're right but but stranger things captures that nostalgia that you long for yeah and and makes it makes it everything you desire so and other than that, it's an amazing story, great cast of actors, great characters. Uh, other than that, uh, I've been working on working on a comic book that I wrote, um, really? working on il- illustrating it. Yeah, I've, I've written a few, and this is the first one that I'm I'm finally getting around to illustrating, and uh, hopefully I will have that done soon. Nice. Do you have That's a title? Awesome. Do we have a title? Uh, working title is Kairos Knot. <laughs> cool. Yeah, Kyra, Vicky, what about you? Not, not in the like. Oh, I'm sorry, not to interrupt, no, Vicky. I apologize, sorry. but not in like the exploratory sense. Am I hearing that correctly? Like Kairos in the sense of time. Yes. Okay. And then and, so like explorer and of time. It's an explorer of yes, time. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Nice. Cool. What about you, Vicky? What have you been up to this week? That work. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's about yeah. it. Um, we. I was working on this week. Um, I was working on an online quiz, a fun online quiz, so we can um, reach to a segment of, I guess, the population that we're trying to get to in yeah. the library. Um, well, that's cool. Yeah. So I've been working on that all week and taking my work home and doing some <laughs> research at home and stuff. But that's about it, really. I um, This week, it's, it's become a painful reminder that some time ago, I made the decision to, to stop subscribing to cable or satellite and just live on whatever free broadcast television offers and... And in a metropolitan area like Dallas, there's, there's plenty of channels. There's still nothing on, but there's plenty of channels. But as I've started getting up earlier in the mornings and I'm watching TV to kind of try and wake up, I, I have got to stop watching the Japanese channel, all the Korean dramas. <laughs> it's, it's freaking with my brain, man. I, I'm like, I've got to get up and get ready for work but i'm like but but is she gonna is she gonna tell her friend that she's sick I'm like, well, well i'm way too young to to suddenly have to be watching not only watching my stories watching my stories in, in a language i have no freaking clue how to understand so that's that's been a, most of my week's been kind of this realization that i've got to stop watching japanese television i, I don't know that that's true i mean a good story is a good story regardless of its of its cultural it's, origin you know it's it's so so bizarre because it's so much of it is I don't understand what like I, I some of it they subtitle and some of it they don't and when you're watching something that's not subtitled and it's like the, the narrative that you're building in your head of the conversation can go to you're just like I would love to know how far off base I really am <laughs> yeah you might show. you might be experiencing a far more interesting story than, than what is actually occurring <laughs> yeah. probably, no in my brain that's probably very true uh, well you know it's been a relatively quiet week around here for us I mean everybody's been kind of Rocking their own stuff. Yeah. Um, we really wanted to, to look at advertising, which is really the main topic for this week. Man, there's a lot to get into with, with advertising. This You're dealing with, with something that's been part of human culture for centuries, almost since man was walking upright and came down out of the trees. Oh, he's, he's tried to tell somebody else that something he has is worth a value and to come to him for it. Um, Andrew, what, what have you you've been doing some some looking into this stuff? What have you found? Um, most of what I've uh, done research on has been um, advertising within uh, uh, popular culture, uh, television, film, 
uh, TV, music. Um, but uh, I've got a little bit more ancient history. Yeah, yeah Jeremy, you I were looking. Jeremy into the goes actual. a little bit further back for us. Yeah, a um, couple of interesting uh, historical facts that I found were that advertising really goes back as far, even maybe even further, but it goes back as far as ancient Egyptians, ancient Greece, and Romanians um, used papyrus to uh, illustrate advertisements, write up advertisements, stuff like that. It was pretty cool. Um, also, you know. We've seen a lot in anthropological and archaeological findings about cave paintings and stuff like that, and we we see that that is really cool as an art find, but not so far back, that medium has been used to convey um, advertisement messages, you know, maybe consumer messages, stuff like that, to advertise services and stuff like that. It's interesting that you mentioned that because I've, I've been to Pompeii. And, and because it was underneath ash for centuries, everything is really well preserved, including murals on walls. And I can remember going into, uh, we'll call it a, a, a house of negotiable affection. And the menu board is still up there where you can see that the Pompeians would walk in and point to what on the, what we'll call it a service, <laughs> on, on the board, I want that one, and then they would direct them to which room practitioner of said offering was was. But it's clear they as had day. Brothels. They oh had yeah, brothels. And, and, and and with the menus and like wow. you walked in and street signs would have small little things written on them. Sometimes they bore a suspicious resemblance to a gentleman's wedding tackle, but that that was to tell you that. You know, you go this way and certain things are this way. Not even so much this is where Frank lives as what you're looking for is down that road. Wow. And it's 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 to the red light fascinating district. to see it so well preserved. I mean you walk the streets of that and, and it's you can see life the only thing you're missing is some bugger walking by in a toga. I mean it's it's that clear a picture of what day to day life was and, and it was there then. That's cool. It's it's really weird. And we were talking about uh, advertising coming about uh, as with the oldest or proverbial oldest profession in the book, and I guess this speaks to it. It's like uh, yeah, prostitution. <laughs> yeah, prostitution. As, as, as long as anyone's <laughs> needed love, anywhere, and someone's yeah, probably been point. willing to provide <laughs> said love and for goods and or services. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jamie. I didn't mean to. Um, I mean, other than. Advertising sex work, I would say, <laughs> pol- political uh, services, and that that was probably what dominated advertisement in uh, Pompeii and, and Egyptian and Greece and, and Roman culture. Um, also in India, as far back as 4000 BCE, we've we've found uh, uh, rock and wall paintings used for conveying um, advertisements. Um. As far as I, like we were talking about, as it's moved on through the through the centuries, uh, we were talking earlier in in the Middle Ages, uh, and I believe close to Eastern Europe. We're talking probably closer to Poland than well, may even have been Italy. Now that I think about it, um, they would gather if you provided a specific good or a specific service. Uh, you were a member of a guild, and. Th- to be a member of that guild was to sort of subject yourself to all of these rules, one of which was no advertising. You, you were required to make the same good at the same quality for the same price as every other member of the guild, and they would regulate to the point of regulating you're coughing too loud in the marketplace. We don't want you because you might be coughing just to draw that little bit of attention to yourself to come see your wares because you've snuck around and made something better than the rest of us. Everything had to be... So it was like an interesting sort of experiment where they, at that point, they recognized the power of of advertising, putting yourself forward, drawing attention to yourself, to say, you need to stop doing that because we're all supposed to be equal, and this only works if everybody's 
on the same page, making the same shoddy goods for the same price. <laughs> so was it like a medieval socialism? I, kind of more like probably a medieval like iron fisted union is probably the closer mm-hmm. because that was everything was to the good of all of the manufacturers of that good. Um, so it was it was they were all pulling together. You just weren't allowed to pull any harder than anybody else was. Yeah, it was good. It was good for the the producers, but for the person you know to whom the product is going, not as good because yeah. there's no opportunity for somebody to stand above and say, you know, no, my mine is clearly the best, and I should be compensated, you know, accordingly. Yeah, can't have that. Yeah. Can't have, didn't last long, as I recall. It's been a while since I've studied medieval history, but uh, it didn't last long, so it wasn't a. Um, and I'm pretty sure it all ended in violence. So, yeah, <laughs> it's, as as things like that are want to do rules like that, yeah, there's bound to be a revolution. Um, let's see. What else do we have as far as... I'm thinking we're moving through medieval times. Victorian era was really maybe... That's the earliest I can think of of seeing actual advertisements. advertisements. Book, magazine, you know, sort of pamphlet advertising. And they always have that really distinct wording to them. There's There's that almost very Dickensian sort of rhyme and meter to vintage... Victorian mm-hmm. advertising and it makes me want I would love to know because we can we can especially us as as English speakers we can read Victorian advertising and see like wow we we get the message they're trying to convey I would love to know how the Pompeians in their native language or how the middle the middle ages inhabitants in old English or in Latin how they conveyed their advertising messages yeah. Um, because I mean, it's 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 all a medium. We've you know you move from word of mouth to cave painting to um, you know writing on papyrus to then writing on paper, you know, and then we move into kind of what Andrew was looking at, which was media, uh, you know, in all of its varied myriad forms. Uh, yes, um, I was looking uh, primarily in film, just because that's the easiest to find. Uh, uh, just facts on basically um, one of the early examples one of the earliest examples of product placement in in, uh, in film is in a short film called The Garage uh, Buster Keaton Fatty Arbuckle vehicle uh, comedy featured the logo of Red Crown gasoline in several scenes uh, there's no real proof as to whether or not they are paid for the product placement but this is just like a, an example of that They're, them just placing that uh, the now product. we have product integration yeah. where you know the companies pay for this by putting their 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 uh, products in as advertisements advertisements <laughs> pardon me <laughs> both uh, right either yeah, right. Say that's totally a legit uh, pronunciation yeah the the movie itself is uh, about them operating a combination garage and fire station and they just get into hijinks um uh, one of the most po- uh, the more popular examples of uh, product placement and and film and one of the first to uh, gain notor- notoriety was a movie called uh, Wings, uh, 1927. It was the first to win an Academy Award for Best Picture um, that showed product placement prominently. Uh, it contained a plug for Hershey's Chocolate. Uh, the basic uh, premise was there's two young men, really? one rich, one middle class, uh, who are in love with the same woman. Uh, they become fighter pilots in, in World War One. That's a... Uh, it's called Wings. <laughs> Apparently, it was, a big t- it was a big thing. Yes. Yeah, how does Hershey's, Hershey's fit chocolate? Into that? Um, uh, I watched a, a short video on it, and they basically like but they pull a Hershey's out to eat it, and there's like a five second, sp- <laughs> just like the, a camera shot, uh, just a one of the Hershey's. one shot of the, of the Hershey's, as though it's the character in the film. Um, <laughs> but it, it was pretty interesting. Um, I'd be curious at what point in time in that in that film history they discovered that what we would call subliminal advertising the in five feet of film if every 100 millisecond you put a picture of of frank's hot dogs then by the end of the film people are going to really want frank's hot dogs and they'll have no idea why they want frank's hot dogs i I, I would be curious to know when that like when (laughs) the first person who figured that little gem out uh, an interesting tidbit. This is years later. Everybody knows about E.T. and Reese's Pieces, 1982, uh, Steven Spielberg's right. E.T. Um, Otherwise known as M&M's Falling. Uh, during production, um, Amblin Productions uh, 
approached Mars Inc. about a possible tie-in between M&Ms in the film. Um, they turned them down, and Hershey's jumped on it, and and that's when they uh, they came up with the idea to just feature Reese's Pieces. It's basically the same concept, and. Hershey's once again jumps in. Yeah. What's funny is uh, while researching this, I saw that Pepsi is everywhere. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. the, especially in the '80s, Reebok and Pepsi mm-hmm. were like the progenitors of of this sort of advertising. It it was amazing to see because I was digging through so many so many sources, and constantly those two would come up. Sometimes Pizza Hut, but Pepsi and Reebok. And Reebok you don't even see these days. Pepsi's yeah. kind of I think taken a hit in, in the past few years it's interesting what you're saying about about mars and the m&ms and the Reese's pieces because willy wonka and the chocolate factory was essentially bankrolled by i want to say it was quaker they approached quaker and said we're going to make this movie version of this great book if for a certain amount of money would you like to you provide us with money for the movie and you can make we'll license you to make the candy bars and you know will you'll make a candy bar tied in with this movie and we will put it in the movie and kids are going to want to come eat it. Quaker said, yeah, there's the money got to work on the candy bar and could not make a candy bar that, that didn't taste like butt apparently <laughs> to the point where they finally just threw up their hands and went like, we, we can't make a candy bar for this. And wow. But they've still got the money, and the movie got made, and sort of <laughs> Quaker, to a certain extent, bankrolled Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory like for free. <laughs> they, got, they got nothing out of it except a, they got a, no product placement a, a trivia for their investment. question somewhere 30, 40 years down the line. And yeah, those, it's, candy oh, bars, I, I was just going to say those candy bars were buried in the desert somewhere. <laughs> yeah. I think the ET card. All of yeah. those candy bars ended up just being oatmeal like, <laughs> sludge. You know, I think <laughs> I've eaten that breakfast bar that has some of those old candy bars. What were you going to say, Robbie? Oh, well, I was just going to say, I think it's interesting how um, the influence of, of companies that uh, you know, would or would not want to do product placement can influence the development of a piece of art, whether it's like like Marty just described, where the, this opportunity for a product placement that uh, that failed. Um, something that comes to mind uh, for me is uh, the the film Repo Man from the '80s. Um, it's a very low budget independent film, and uh, one of the problems they ran into was um, they could not afford to. Uh, to, to, to have any product placement. Um, so they had to go about uh, making sure that anything, any product, in, you know, in the shot that would have a corporate logo and would, you know, serve as product placement was was obscured or hidden. I believe the process is called chiefing. But uh, the way Repo Man did it was really unique and is one of the, the, the kind of identifiers of the movie is anything any product is uh whether it's food or uh you know a household good um the the box or container it is in is stark white with just black letters describing what it is so for instance a can of beer isn't budweiser it's beer and this is true you know not only in the in the homes uh but it's true in the you know convenience stores and you know, moments that you, you find yourselves, you know, they're, they're in some kind of marketplace. All of the products on the shelves are just stark white boxes that read cereal and milk and etc. And, and, you know, it's, it, it, it kind of becomes a symbol of the movie of, of like, you know, th- this person who's tuned out from society and, you know, it, he's, he's bombarded with advertisements and they didn't, you know, they, they couldn't have intended it to mean that, but it kind of winds up meaning that just by the process of them trying to avoid having to pay any kind of any fees to these these companies and yeah and you see that i mean i can think of alton brown's good eats every time he opens that refrigerator that's i mean you see sort of genericized and, and I, I, I there's a lot of places that make up their own labels like you know i can you could couldn't swing a dead cat in popular culture without hitting a tv show that took a fictitious product that they made just as a you know and and it's become a part of the cultural zeitgeist I, i'm thinking like didn't didn't 30 rock have like the the, well, a whole the lot of meat stuff. cat or, mm-hmm. I, I, I didn't get a chance to watch a lot like the, the cheesy sort of blasters meat, meat cat, meat cat, yeah cheesy blasters, cheesy yeah. blasters. What that's what i'm thinking of do you know the song Vicky? yeah, yeah you, can like, you take quick. some jack cheese roll it in a pizza no you take you take a hot, hot dog, dog. 
Wrap it in a pizza. R- no, no. Take a hot dog. What is it? Oh, fill it Take with some jack dog, cheese. Wrap it in a pizza. Wrap it in a pizza. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's and a you jack got cheesy cheese. blasters. Yeah, you, got you got to stuff it with jack cheese first. Yes. Yeah. Or red, red, red apple cigarettes and Tarantino films. Kevin no. mm-hmm. Smith always had nails. Oh, cigarettes. Yeah, red apples, my favorites. <laughs> Crestios. Uh, Crestios. Crestios. Could you point me to the burns? <laughs> <laughs> I promise um, I won't devolve that, this into just Simpsons references. <laughs> as tempted as I Make am. Make no promise you that, can't keep, sir. Yeah. That idea you were talking about brought to mind two things. One, I want to go into a little bit uh, further uh, an- analysis later on in this episode. Uh, but it was they live how all of the, yes. the billboards, mm-hmm. the Obey billbo- billboards, everything yeah, basically please. points to the control that's being put over the populace. Uh, the other thing was... Um, uh, well, it's not the science of sleep. What's the other one? Um, the eternal sunshine, sunshine of the spotless, spotless mind. Whenever they're in dream sequences or memories, rather, not, um, they anything that might have uh, uh, a, a detailed description or a product itself. They're in a library instead of showing like the the titles of the books because your mem- your memory doesn't work that way you can't memorize every yeah. single title on the it's everything's just kind of like faded or or digitized <laughs> uh, to bring about the the idea of or the thought of you can't remember everything right. that you see so. yeah yeah how how worth it is it for these you know for us to be bombarded with advertisements when it's yeah. Such yeah. sensory overload. How much of it can we really ingest? Yeah. You know? yeah. That's probably something. Like you said, we want to get into that a little bit deeper. This was probably as good a time as any. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, uh, we'll go ahead and step a little deeper into this waiting pool of social networking and social construct. And I could probably think of other words that don't mean what I mean them to mean. It so we'll ugly. be right back after this. Do stick around with us. There's more to come here on Revolving Culture. the most inviting glass of beer you've ever tasted. Sure. Cold, golden Budweiser with that good taste for good times. So go ahead. Live life every golden minute of it. Enjoy Budweiser. Every golden drop of it. Budweiser beer is for folks who know where there's life. Welcome back to Revolving Culture. Our uh, topic this week is advertising. We, uh, we take a look at a little bit about the, the sort of foundational elements in history as far as advertising goes. And we got a little bit into uh, movies and TVs. Um, Andrew, you were talking about product placement earlier. Um, what, uh, what other examples have you come up with on that? Oh, I think everyone will remember uh, Castaway. They had both FedEx uh, yeah. shown prominently. Uh, uh, volleyball. Yes, Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> Not only is it one of the characters' names, but that character is, the is named the after the brand of volleyball. <laughs> you know, FedEx, they were hesitant to show like a FedEx plane going down and yeah. being a cause of, of this disaster. But uh, I think they, when they brought the crew uh, to their headquarters, it kind of convinced them that they were trying to show them in a good light as yeah. a, a company that you know a good man works for, a strong yeah. man. And a company that went and found their good man, because if yeah. I remember correctly, they're <laughs> instrumental in him finally being located. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was one. Another uh, Tom Hanks vehicle, you've got Mail, um, AOL, yeah. which AOL is was... the defunct. Is Oh yeah, it, it's still I think it, it exists as sort of an <laughs> internet <laughs> brand, but but the company that I worked for in the mid '90s no longer exists. That's not really a. Um, All I know is I have a stack of those discs about a foot high, which means I have <laughs> thousands of hours of free internet. <laughs> Use them to take down squirrels. Yeah, exactly. That's it's, it's interesting. I can yeah. remember Office Space. You know the the red slimline stapler. They didn't make a red stapler. 
But after Office Space, they got a swing line. Excuse me, swing line. they got so inundated with the requests for a red swing line stapler that they a started making it. And and as last time I checked, they charge more for the red stapler. Of than, it's a value added. <laughs> yeah, it process. really is. It's, they're it's getting their thing. monies back on that. I may be jumping the gun on this, but um, when you said AOL product placement and songs, that classic Bugaboo song by Destiny's Child. Yeah, we can no, nobody? I guess I'm not <laughs> They're like, with this. <laughs> They said, uh, call MCI to cut the phone cords. T- tell AOL to make my email stop. Uh, I forgot the other line, but yeah, I mean, that's really? true. Yeah. That's something we don't think about as, as often is, is product placement and songs because it's there. Oh. I mean, it's all over the place. I have some yeah. good notes Woke on it. up in a yeah. new Bugatti. Yeah. <laughs> what were you saying, Andrew? I'm sorry. I have some good notes on uh, Kiss's uh, merchandising. Oh, yeah. oh I just, it's, it's pretty extensive. Guys. The thing about Bugaboo that really is funny to me is that like MCI and AOL do not exist, and I think they mentioned pagers in the song as well. So <laughs> let's date that even farther. Going to the yeah. blockbuster. Kiss will slap their logo on anything that stands still oh. long enough to. To be kind of, uh, you know, there's an old lady at a street corner somewhere that, that Gene Simmons passed by and thought, oh, wow, look, something stationary. It's Kiss's old lady. <laughs> Even something that's that's intended to stand still forever, like a casket. Yes, <laughs> it's, the Kiss casket, two It's funny you mention that. The, the video game company Acclaim, back, I want to say in the late 90s, early 2000s, I, I would have to get, they would come up with these really bizarre sort of ways of kind of getting their message out and, and ways to get people to plaster their logo on something. I swear there was an instance where they offered to pay for someone's headstone provided they were allowed to put the word acclaim their logo on the headstone. And if I remember correctly, part of the, the pitch for this was it might be of significant interest to poorer people. Oh, God. And, and she was just like, how objectionable a human being do you have to be to have... Been? Like, I, I, would, I would love to think in a just world that that marketing meeting, when somebody pointed that out, somebody else just slapped him. <laughs> no. As on the a little bit on the kiss casket, um, they also made other memorial products. But on Howard Stern's radio show, uh, Gene, said of, Gene Simmons said of the casket, "This is the ultimate kiss collectible. I love living, but this makes the alternative look pretty damn good." <laughs> That's right, because nothing, nothing brightens up the eternal afterlife quite like being able to see the kiss logo. Man, you got to be a rabid Kiss Army fan, of which I imagine there are many. I would, I would probably be depressed to know how many of those they've sold. If it was good enough for Dimebag Daryl, it's probably good <laughs> that's, enough for that's us. Good point. Um, other things Kiss has licensed. Uh, well, it, it comes to more than three thousand product categories, from lunch boxes, yeah. uh, comic books, action figures, condoms. Uh, in two thousand two, a line of Kiss condoms entitled. Kiss condoms with two Ks <laughs> once again. Um, see, they missed an opportunity. They should have been called like something to do with love guns. Oh, see, well, see, I was uh, thinking they had different God varieties. Or... They had love gun protection. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Tongue thank lubricated you. and studded Paul. Oh. <laughs> uh, they also had beauty products. Kiss him and kiss her. Uh, oh my. Platinum Visa card, pinball, video games, uh, Kiss, Psycho Circus, The Nightmare Child was released for PC and Dreamcast in two thousand. Um, that's. I think funny the Kardashians also had a like a debit card or something like oh, that. Oh well, yeah, that's what yeah. got them in serious yeah, trouble because yeah. they're like those high interest loan credit cards. It's interesting you mentioned the the, the comic book because I can remember we're talking late seventies when that comic book came out and Marvel Comics is who they worked with. And the first, like the gimmick was the first. I don't remember how many uh, copies you got had been printed and all of the red ink used for that comic that's that excuse me that short run of publishing all of the red ink had been made using the blood of all four like all four members had gone to the the ink manufacturing company and all like you know pricked their finger dropped their blood into the ink and so that was like their big kicker was like buy them the, the first issue of Marvel Comics new Kiss because issue 1 printed in Kiss's blood 
Yeah, it had some of their blood, like traces. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't, was, yeah, they did slit their throats. Yeah. <laughs> For the record, it was not <laughs> the entire batch of red ink. They didn't. No, they, no, red, their blood went into the red ink. I yeah. apologize if I, I didn't make I don't, that. I don't think we would have had any more Kiss had that been true. <laughs> and really, as much as I love Kiss, given where we've gotten to with them in marketing, yeah. would that really have been such a thing? <laughs> I have just a few more uh, product placement and film, just um, where we might remember as uh, Little Nicky and Happy Gilmore. Uh, both had Subway uh, product placement pretty strongly <laughs> featured. Um, Harold and Kumar go to White Castles. self explanatory That's right there in the title. Uh, <laughs> uh, That's trans- the second set of Transformers had GM, so they had Chevy, Pontiac, GMC vehicles. Zombieland had Twinkies. The internship had Google. Back to the Future had Pepsi. Risky Business, uh, Ray-Ban, and Demolition Man... Who can guess? Taco, Taco Bell. Bell. Yeah, yeah. guys. <laughs> and I will thank the, you that Back the to the Future remaining. had Pepsi and Pizza and <laughs> Excuse me, Pizza Hut, actually. Wow, I'm doing that one right now. <laughs> <laughs> I say that because there's one a block and a half away. Yeah, the, re- the rehydrator. Yeah, pizza Patron. <laughs> I only remember Godfather's Pizza. Like I, I like to believe that Pizza Patron just kind of evolved out of Godfather's Pizza, <laughs> which for years in the eighties and nineties. No, Pizza Patron is Indiana Jones. Really, the guy looks just like. <laughs> looks Pizza like Patron is based out of Austin, I thought. I don't. Wouldn't know. be. I'm making it up. I think. I think Pizza Patron. Like not not to to go on a tangent here, but Pizza Patron makes for an interesting example of when uh, a particular advertising or or marketing stunt. Can can somewhat backfire, not necessarily to the detriment of the company's image, but certainly to its customers. Um, I don't know how many of you recall. A few years ago, uh, Pizza Patron had a pr- promotion where um, if you placed your order in Spanish, you could have a free pizza. And th- what that amounted to was walking up to the counter and saying "Pizza por favor." Yeah, that that was the entirety of what you needed to do <laughs> to earn your free pizza. But that did not stop. An onslaught of, of you know, of of, of, of yeah, you know, people, people yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> people insisting that that There's if you're going to be in pizza. America, yeah, I, I should be able to order my pizza you in can. English. You just won't get it for free. Yeah, it was it fascinated me, but uh, what did you you looked like you'd found something, Andrew. Oh no! I, I was just uh, listening to R- Robbie ex- expound <laughs> on <laughs> on Pizza Patron. Um, <laughs> Are they still running that offer? I don't, I don't think so. Let's find out. Let's call him. Yeah. That's a turn. I yeah. also had a, a pretty sweet uh, promotion where if you brought pe- pesos in, yeah, you, they, you, still yeah. Oh, wow. they still do that. Yeah, that 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 is existent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's that's. Nice, if you bring guys. pesos in, you get a free pizza. Well, you you have to. You're you still have to. Pizza. Yeah, you still have to use them as the currency, pesos. but but they, they don't They'll restrict you them. to the American dollar as that's a as a payment cool. method. They will accept pesos as legal tender. Yes. for this particular transaction. That's pretty cool. Um, I also found uh, some information on cars uh, used in movies. Uh, Herbie the Love Bug was a Volkswagen Beetle. RoboCop had a Ford Taurus, which it baffles me because all I know <laughs> of Ford Taurus is those yeah, pretty pedestrian sort of <laughs> yeah. Blade, I drove a tourist Blade station had a wagon. Challenger, it was Dodge Challenger. POS, man. Blade. Oh, oh yeah. Dodge that was a nice car, yeah, too. That was a nice car. What, what car did it have? Bullet driver, a Steve McQueen driver. Steve McQueen? Uh, Bullet wasn't that a? a uh, I would think that was a, a Mustang Cobra. I would venture to guess, I would but guess a as much as I watch Top Gear, that one particculiarly has, has lost me. While we speculate, I'm going to actually look it up. Yeah. Oh, guys! By the way, Pizza authority. Patron's first store was in Dallas. I was thinking Boyo Regio. Ooh. Their first one was in Austin. That's cool. Oh, no, that's nice. But yeah, their Dallas original. Was in Dallas. If we're talking about <laughs> cars and movies, uh, the, the the biggest one I can think of is we're looking at you know, the Fast and the Furious. I mean, that is all that movie is, is selling brands of cars. Yeah. <laughs> but who, well, I mean, who so went out Transformers, and bought, right? I mean, how many Supras were sold? When oh, I, I would suggest more than, than so? we think, because I can remember after the... And I, I don't know that I have seen a single one of those in its entirety. I've seen bits and pieces of all of them. But I think I can remember when the second one came out, The one of the characters was the little, I think, Japanese girl. Who drove around? Whose who's race car was like a pink Toyota of some kind? I'm thinking I'm probably getting this wrong. Like a Celica or something. They're going to the Fast and the Furious fans are going to be burning me in effigy out. The front <laughs> <laughs> but I can remember after that came out, like you started to see those cars in that color pink, like everywhere. Oh. <laughs> so I, I, I would suggest that there was a lot of I want that car 
And they suddenly auto traders getting a whole lot more business on their website because everyone's looking for old Supras and old. I can soup that up, you know. Come on, if Vin <laughs> Diesel can do it, anybody can. How many uh, DeLoreans thing do you think were oh, sold yeah, after Max? Before the company DeLoreans. went out of business, probably. <laughs> you know, and I almost think death that death traps. Death traps. I almost think the company was out of business. Like, like, I don't know that, that the Back to the Future movies spiked the sale of those. But after, because really when Back to the Future came out, this whole, like, collectible, vintage mm. nostalgia thing yeah. wasn't really as heavy a deal. And I think probably by the early to mid-90s when that's, people start going, like, I love Back to the Future. I want that DeLorean. And they started looking around and going, like, well, you know, this dude's got an old DeLorean that's been rusting in a pull apart place because nobody was buying him after John DeLorean got busted for Coke. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think probably at, at the time it didn't do a whole lot for DeLorean, but at, what it did was it made those that survived now to be completely collectible because that's a, that's like a Holy grail for a, a nerd collector is uh, I, I know the guy from um, that wrote ready player one, Ernest Klein. He bought one and cause he's as, maybe a bigger eighties head than me. And he bought one, DeLorean, decked it out, looks just like the time machine, but then he threw all sorts of other nerd on it. Like, it's the DeLorean time machine with the Ghostbusters logo on each door, a license plate that says Ecto-2. It's got a, a Ghostbusters, you know, their, their little nuclear pack in the back. It's got the oscillation overthruster from Buckaroo Banzai in the Eighth Dimension. It is just this, like... This Nirvana-like collection of automotive geekery. And I think he gave it away as, like, he had a contest based on Ready Player One. And the winner was was handed that car as their prize at, I want to say, San Diego Comic-Con, probably. But I saw pictures of it, and, and it will live forever in my brain as the, like, I just, there's everything I love is in that car. Before we move off of cars, I just wanted to clarify that Bullet was driving a 1968 Ford Mustang GT. I was really close. <laughs> Jeremy and I got there. Yeah, I, and got I've there. seen it. I, they showed it on one of the episodes of Top Gear. They were going through famous cars. And they were showing that car. They showed the Ferrari that James Dean ordered and never got to drive because oh. it, it was being delayed. So while he was waiting for it, he went tooling around and his Porsche ended badly. Yeah. So he never actually saw the Ferrari um, they, they had Keith Moon's old limo that he drove into, depending on which urban rock legend you go through, drove it either into a pool or not into a pool or into a lake or not into a lake, depending on who you ask. But that, that somebody was selling that. Like it had just been in somebody's garage, just gathering rust. <laughs> Ford, if you're listening, by the way, uh, we accept checks or uh, <laughs> you know, money know, order. Depending on where um, you're talking to somebody from Oklahoma, I don't know necessarily where my, most of my family fall in the Ford versus Chevy. I don't want to take a side because then I'll end up getting disowned. If oh, I pick well, the wrong I'm for side. sale. Whoever, whoever gets to me first. Are we ready to take a break and uh, yeah, re- we're getting recombobulate? Close. Yeah, if we want to, we can. Um, what we'll do here is we'll take a quick break. We'll... Um, We're going to take a look at a couple of things. When we come back, please join us because we've talked about where it's been. We've talked about where it is. Let's let's talk when we come back a little bit about where it may be going because I I, I see a huge shift in where advertising is going to have to find its place in the world. And I think we'll get into that as soon as we come back. Stick around with us. You are listening to Revolving Culture. shave is so powerful, it drives women right out of their minds. That's why we have to put instructions on self-defense in every package. 
High Karate, the brisk splash-on aftershave that smooths and soothes and cools. High Karate, aftershave, cologne, and gift sets. High Karate, be careful how you... Welcome back to Revolving Culture. Our topic this week is advertising. Uh, we've, we've talked a little bit about several different ways that, that advertisers are getting their message out over the years. Uh, one of the new ways, I thought this was really interesting, um, and, and I'm not sure quite how valid it is, but it's valid enough that companies are paying really good money to consultants to, to buy these services, and that's, that's a sort of glorified version of aromatherapy. Uh, people are selling to retailers. They've done all of these sort of brain scan type studies to indicate that certain scents make certain specific scents make people buy certain things you know and so they they sell like you're 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 working at an antique store this this smell of lavender and jade well people are more inclined to go and buy your your particular china if if they smell that so people are they'll subscribe to services retailers will subscribe to services where they'll put these elaborate systems into their you know big box retail stores and they will sort of pump out a very light hint of a certain scent because they've been they their sort of marketing studies have shown that the people react this way when they smell this um i think that's really there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on now they're a, a little more less overt and a little more kind of trying to just put their message across your passing eye even if you're not looking for it uh, jeremy you look like you had something you wanted to uh, well, yeah, to add to that, um, to add to the idea of um, the air being filled with a special scent to to a- aid your shopping experience, um, we're all familiar with you get into an elevator and there's some easy listening el- Muzak. Muzak going on. Muzak. And it feels like that type of music is designed to make you feel at ease because you get into this box, this metal box that's like a cage and your fate is uncertain because you're only (laughs) held up by a string Um, but you get to the next floor just fine Um, but you 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 might recognize that same sound if you go into maybe not today but you know a decade ago, two decades ago going to a grocery store and there's some slow music playing and the idea was that it would help you become more relaxed in the store you might spend longer in the store and you might buy more in the store yeah, everything is in service of staying longer right keep you in those doors as long as possible yeah so that the the music and the the scent the idea of the scent um is is environmental subliminal conditioning basically um as far as history goes in the early 20th century the u.s adopted the idea that human instincts could be targeted and harnessed for the sake of uh, buying products. Really? We could, yeah, we could be coerced into um, preferring certain markets and certain products over others. Um, That's, I, I'm sorry, go ahead, Rob. Oh, I was just going to say that, uh, yeah, part of that coercion is... Uh, Making making efforts to to remove your in, inhibition or your your fear about uh, you know a purchasing decision that you're you're about to make, um, especially nowadays with with the amount of like kind of conspicuous consumption that we can allow ourselves to to fall into um, with uh, you know technology and everything like that. And what you know, an example that uh, that my that always gets a laugh from my wife and I is the uh, uh, the, the the store cons. Uh, that just sells you know appliances and televisions and the like, but their their tagline is "You deserve it," and you know the, <laughs> the and anybody who might be on the precipice of of buying a big screen TV or something, you know the rational side of them is going to look for you know uh, something more productive to do with that money is going to tell themselves no that's it's silly I don't need a new TV I have a perfectly functional. TV right now. I don't hate anything about my TV. Why do I want this big screen TV? But I'm I'm kind of thinking about it, and all I need is somebody to to, to talk me over the it. ledge. Yeah, to say you know what I am worth it. I've I've been I've been eating crap at my job all week, and yeah. and and you know that's that's my money that I earned. And you know what? You're right, cons. I do deserve it, and I'm going to go buy it right now. And I, I think that's I mean you're talking especially with big ticket items. That's really their challenge. If, you're, if they're going to sell you a new computer or a new television, I mean, I think that's the reason why 
I can't name the last movie I saw in which any denizen of any imaginary universe in Hollywood uses anything other than an Apple laptop. Like, I can't remember the last time I saw a PC because Apple has sort of cornered the Hollywood market with all these studios. It says if your character is using a computer on screen, they're using an Apple computer. And I think that's part of that because that's that's the look. Ben Affleck uses Apple computer, you know. And I, I, that's part of the. I, you want to be. You deserve to be in the same breath as a Ben Affleck or a Brad Pitt. Go buy that new Apple computer. Yeah, the the idea of you know endorsement and and all you need is this this product to make you as capable and successful and and as as this person who's who's demonstrating it for you. That's the yeah. only that's the only difference between you and him. Between you and Ben Affleck, is that Apple computer sitting <laughs> I was going to say, or Carrie on Sex in the City. Yeah, yeah, Sex in the City was a really good... I wonder, I, I would love to know statistically how many sort of just regular middle class, middle America knew who pro, what Prada was prior to Sex in the City versus how many know what Prada is after Sex in the City. Oh, she many? used Apple products. She had oh, an Apple she? computer, yeah. You can tell how much I watched. <laughs> no, she, she didn't use an IBM ThinkPad? No, she should have. <laughs> she, 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 <laughs> she wanted quality. She I mean, China, <laughs> the, the Asian countries have learned, especially like Japan, learned that lesson. They spend the kind of money that American corporations only dream that they could spend for advertising, which was why you know the Asian market, especially in Japan, commercials for deodorant starring Brad Pitt. You know, you know, Sir Lawrence so Olivier wants you to buy Depends Undergarment. That they <laughs> they throw money to get A list Hollywood to come over there and, you know, pimp the, the new super dry, sexy underwear adventure time Who yay. could forget um Bruce Willis and Seagram's, right? Oh, was yeah. Seagram's? So that was Bruce a... Willis made Seagram's <laughs> cool. For those of us who, who aren't particularly beer drinkers, Bruce Willis in the 80s and early 90s made the ability to go like, oh, yeah, I don't really want a beer, but I can have a Seagram's golden wine cooler, and nobody was going to say John anything. John McClane says so. Because John <laughs> McClane drinks Seagram's golden wine cooler while singing the blues. Yeah. You're speaking, you were talking about Japanese culture adopting these consumers' values, and it reminded me of a podcast I listened to recently, uh, by it. it was a cracked podcast about how things are lost in translation basically and they were talking about the eastern idea of wabi sabi and it's um it's similar to how we think of consumerism um the the example they brought to they brought was um a, if you were at an antiques market in Asia and you saw a a jaw or like an old vase or something like that and it was cracked um, you would think oh wow that's a vintage uh, vase it's been around for years that's awesome I wonder what the value is Uh, because we're a consumerist society that's uh, we've been trained to to ask those questions those sorts of questions but wabi-sabi is uh, this ideal that uh, they have Mm -hmm. I'm thinking it's Japanese. Uh, um, everything has beauty in it, even something that's been through right. a lot of uh, trauma, including a vase, something that's inanimate, still has some... It's been through the same sorts of travails that we might have yeah. experienced. But even saying it, I don't understand it. I wouldn't feel the ingrained... You know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a cultural, that's a cultural thing that, that's part and parcel to... Uh, really, anytime you're exposed, as like I said, unfortunately, I've been watching a lot of this sort of television. Um, it's it's such a different mindset, almost by almost on a biological level, not not a genetic, but but as far as like the the foods that that you've become accustomed to eating, cuisine from that region. It's it's such a different culture. It is hard sometimes for us to wrap our brains around it. And the translation, it made, when you said lost in translation, it made me think. I wish I could remember the name of the like Japanese. I believe it's a Japanese toothpaste company, and I I'd sw- I'd swear to this, but if you put a gun to my head, I don't know that I'd stake my life on it. I'd swear that like their logo for for that particular toothpaste company translated to American comes out to something equivalent to "Who pooped in my mouth." <laughs> <laughs> and oh. it's, it's, it's it's that sort of it, it, there's such a weird change almost at an international Dateline level of, of society that, that I'd be curious to know. What it was like to grow up like that? Like, where, how do you? How do they see American marketing culture? And yeah. are they having the same conversation? Going, I just don't understand it. I was talking to Robbie earlier today about this movie I watched uh, maybe two years ago. Uh, Vicky and I were at home, and it was on uh, Netflix. 
and the little uh, preview kind of for some whatever reason I, I clicked mm-hmm. on it and uh, you know watched it but it was a movie called uh, Branded from 2012 it's I'm guessing a joint uh, production between maybe an, an American and Russian studio mm-hmm. but the producer is Russian um, and they have an American uh, executive producer as well and a mostly American cast but you can you can tell it's not it doesn't take place in I guess it takes place in a, a, a futuristic Russia of 2017 where uh, the corporations that have dominated uh, American consumerism have moved in uh, to try to claim Russia. And right. this guy basically, uh, I guess he has a near death, near death experience or something, and he gains the power to see uh, these corporations as these evil monsters that loom over everything and mm-hmm. infect people. And this coming from a post-communist Russia where... Yeah, you know they were completely against American consumerism, and this is maybe just a backlash in how they they view our yeah. invasion. Um, but I guess that's a more negative light than the Japanese might see it. Well, and it raises an interesting question with you talking about the, um, the sort of negative aspect. Like we all, I think, especially in Western society, we're becoming much more cynical about corporations and advertising. And we're we're getting to a point where, you know, Netflix, Hulu, your your DVR that's attached to your satellite channel, all of these things are making it easier for you to skip commercials and not see the advertisements. And so, you know, and, and as we're becoming more and more cynical about the message advertisers are sending us, where do advertisers go from here to 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 get their messages? Just because they're going to find a way. The question is now just. Just where and how, um, yeah. Uh, depending on its validity, and, and and we'll argue this here in a second. But is subliminal like pure subliminal advertising? Do we think that's a path? I I don't think so. I think we were talking about earlier. We were um, people to people, person to person advertising seems to be again the way to go. Uh, it seems like there's this cyclical life to. A lot of things, and advertisement gets caught in one of them, or gets caught in it, um, where it, you know it goes from targeting a specific audience. There's person to person, and then there's you know newspaper and radio. You got mass marketing, and then and then it becomes targeted again, and then it's person to person. So it keeps going through this cycle. And right now, with the the presence of social media and how personal it is and how one person can contact tens of thousands millions of people with the you know the mm-hmm. drop of 125 characters or whatever just because they bought something new and then suddenly tens of thousands of people are buying that same thing like yeah, yeah. that's marketing today yeah yeah the the strongest i mentioned earlier that that uh a lot of times, you know, somebody who's on the precipice of, of making a, a purchasing decision is waiting for someone or something to give them the go ahead. And, you know, noth- nothing is more compelling than, uh, you know, someone that you know personally and someone you trust. Uh, you know, think of all the times when y- you've, you've been on the, the, the precipice of, of spending some discretionary money that you're, you're you know, wanting to to find an excuse not to spend and all it takes is a friend to say, no, no, buy that video game. You're going to have fun with it. Of course. Why not? You know, mm-hmm. and have cheeseburgers for lunch. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 You know, it's, it's, it's not, the, it's not the smart decision, but it's the one you want to make. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, people will always be the most compelling advertisement. And when you were just now, Jeremy saying that it's, it's kind of cyclical, it was making me think of, of uh you know the, the the idea of like snake oil salesmen who are you know petitioning to an audience how how wonderful their their product is and and of course the entire crowd is suspect and you're you're just trying to get my money and they need they need the inside man they need yep, the, the, they get the yeah yeah they need somebody to say you know yes that's you know i'll 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 test your product look at oh wow it's incredible yeah. you know and that you see that still in you know infomercials and everything you need this straw man to, to say I'm just like the consumer that is you know potentially going to purchase this product show me why it's right for me and as long as you can you know people are becoming more and more of an advertising platform and you know if if companies can find a way for uh, you know instead of them telling you that you should have a product mm-hmm. having someone close to you 
tell you that you should have your product have that product because not even I don't even think celebrity endorsements work as well as as they once did because like Marty said yeah. we're cynical we we see past it we know that this is a ploy to to you know make me yeah. you know to compel me in a particular way but if you can get somebody that I trust it's to tell me to have it yes yeah, yeah. It's, it's borrowed credibility and well going going back to what you were talking about with commercials and the the fall of that form of advertisement if it's not somebody you trust telling you to buy a product or to test a product, it's, hey, if you are a member of this group, you get special discounts. You get mm-hmm. special offerings of what we have, like a Netflix account, a Hulu account. You get to yeah. skip the commercials or you get if you're, you know, I have a PlayStation for if I'm a PS Plus member, I get free games every right. month. I get discounts on some games. And, yeah, it feels like, well... 13 bucks on a game here it's not so bad 5 yeah. bucks on a game here but over a year if I've spent $200 on games that they're making a lot of money yeah and and, and they're also counting I think to a certain degree that, that you're then going out and going like man I just got through playing the, the remastered version of Last of Us and yeah, I got it really cheap, you know, yeah. my PlayStation Plus account, man. I, I paid like $10. I got this great game. Yeah. You know, I got Fallout 4 for $25 because I'm an Xbox Gold. You know, that that's the, the borrowed credibility that, that you wouldn't trust somebody from Sony to tell you that. Yeah. But the dude that you're hanging out with at work has just told you how cool this game is and how he got it for 25 right. bucks. They were you're going to go home and sign up for that service. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe maybe that's one of the pathways... Now, to do this, I mean, maybe we're, as far as television goes, because television is still going to have to depend on ad money somehow. And, and maybe that's, maybe we need, we're, maybe that cycle is going to peel back around to the 19, 1930s when one, one product or one company was the sole sponsor of one show. Maybe it's, it's going to be, you know, Scope mouthwashes American Idol or, you know, Pepsodent presents NYPD Blue. Because obviously I watch a lot of current television because those are the two that pop immediately to my head. Yeah, I mean, you, you see it, you know, present in other things. Uh, we, we uh, in sports, for instance, there's, there's no longer, you know, stadiums that have just an ephemeral quality of, of, of a location. They're branded it's with... It's Candlestick with, Park anymore. Yes, it's exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's AT&T Stadium, etc. And, and that's because they... They, they they see it as to to you know keep those names or to to give it you know a, a, you know one of those names for them is a missed opportunity. No, I paid money to to either acquire this property or to build this property. Yeah. I'll be damned if I'm not going to put my logo and my my brand all over. Yeah, it, if you're you know. building a multi billion dollar football stadium like the Death Star here in Arlington, <laughs> you know you're looking for every means to offset, lower your costs so that eventually it starts to make a profit for you. And one of the best ways to do that in this day and age is which big mega corporation wants. AT&T was first in line, giant stadium for the Dallas Cowboys. Yes, please. Here's big bags of cash. Just, well, here's our logo. Just nail that up above the door and we're all good. Yeah, what, what, is, what, what is not considered advertising space? What is allowed to be sacred and and not you know can cannot be invaded by that and you know you you might think that that people can't be but that's not true people didn't someone get like a tattoo of something on their forehead yeah for, for we've, had that. we've had babies yeah. being named you win a free car because yeah. you named your baby kia yeah uh, i mean i i'm probably a prime example of that i draw the line at wearing a t-shirt that says an actual product like a mountain dew but i'm aware that Almost 364 days of the year, I'm a billboard on my shirt for something like a game, a television show, a movie I love. I mean, my closet is filled with sort of, I'm not advertising so much a product that anybody can buy. I'm advertising. Your uh, maybe I, Yeah, I'm yeah. advertising. I love me some Back to the Future. Yeah, you I are love selling. me some wrestling. Yeah. But I'm aware that in a certain way, I'm a billboard because somebody's going to go, what's that on your shirt? And I mean, that's the Back to the Future. Oh really? What is you know? I, I'm selling something, and you know, just being who I am. Yeah, the yeah, it's it's you know it's it's a product of the modern age where these these products are a reflection of your personality. You know, you you're you're making a statement. You're you're there, there's there's a, a tribalism to it. No, I'm I'm with Coke. I'm not with Pepsi. Yeah. I'm. 
I think uh, one thing that uh, has has cropped up, especially with the youth of today, is um, even 20 years ago, uh, it was not cool. It was not deemed cool. It wasn't uh, kosher amongst the youth to um, sell out. They uh, and nowadays, I'm not even certain that young people know what the negative connotations of selling out are. Uh, whereas yeah, I, I don't think there is one now. Yeah, I think uh, we've pretty much yeah, it's an aspiration you know, yourself as a generation. Yeah. You have SoundCloud, you have YouTube ways to put yourself out there and hopefully you get sponsorship. Hopefully we get sponsorship. <laughs> Please like and subscribe. By the way, yeah. we're, we let it be clear. We're not on any particular moral high horse here. This, yeah. is, this is simply what the, the reality of the yeah. world that we live in now. And, and I think that's why we're seeing more advertising on you know YouTube, but even YouTube now is offering pay us money. You won't have to see the ads anymore. Mm-hmm. But you know every website you go to now, CNN. I you know I get my news generally from CNN's website in the mornings, and I have to be careful which of the news stories I click on because some of them are CNN stories with CNN's headlines, and some of them are really hidden clickbait. Yeah. Which, I mean, is a, is a new form of advertising that, that, that's just come up in the last, oh, maybe four or five years. And I think it's going to, to become even more of a commonplace. I mean, clickbait is going to be a defining yeah. moment of, of sort of this era of advertising. And, and wow. it's, it's yeah, while it's not subliminal, it's the, you know, Dwayne The Rock Johnson's net worth will make you <laughs> surprised. And, you know, well, you got to find out now. Yeah, and, and the motivator is, you know, every time we load this page and load these ads we get paid incrementally so why load a story with one page when we can load it with eight and you have to you know scroll through it and i i remember just the the i was i was lucky enough to to have experienced the golden age of the internet before advertising had really found its footing (laughs) mid to late 90s yeah 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 about the time that i was that i was a teenager and i i remember the, the sobering realization that that advertising had found its way into every every corner of the the internet where you couldn't watch a YouTube video without having to when millions of people have gathered their millions of dollars will be spent to get some kind of message to those millions of people yeah do you guys remember uh, Wayne's World um, oh of course yes the scene where he <laughs> kind of blurs the line between uh, speaking out against uh, product yeah, placement yeah product placement in, in, uh, yeah. the scene shows uh, uh Pizza Hut, Reebok, Doritos, and new pr- new printed Pepsi uh, throughout the scene where he's a- acting as though he does not want to. Yeah, he's admonishing the idea <laughs> of, of taking <laughs> advertising money the- while he advertises. <laughs> yeah, and, and I term. imagine those companies paid good money to be a part of a joke about them paying good money to yeah. be a part of a joke. It's very mean, meta level discussion yeah. about <laughs> Fight Club had IKEA and Starbucks and yeah. I, <laughs> airplanes. Airlines. I can just kind of. I mean, I, I think we're getting we're we're getting to the point where we've probably we've seen that the, the future is probably going to be uh, a little more on an individual basis. I, I, you know, and somewhere somewhere is a marketing guy in New York who's going to come up with something even more surprising in ten years from now. We're going to be talking about. Do you remember? Way back when, when there was just pop-up ads, and then and yeah, now this guy's beaming the Pizza Hut flavor cells into your nostrils. Minority Report. <laughs> yes, I was just going to mention it. Yes, the, the yeah the the Steven Spielberg Minority Report film. Uh, part of the part of the uh, the plot is that um, the main character that Tom Cruise is playing uh, has to get new eyeballs in order to uh, pass for someone else because uh, everything uh, you know around him culturally all that guy's clickbait. is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's he's being he's being you 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 are you have personal tailored ads to you that are triggered based on on your your you know your your eyes and yeah. uh, he finds after he gets a new set of eyeballs that as he walks in and out of department stores he's getting the tailored ads of a completely else, different yeah. person. <laughs> Um, as, as we kind of wrap this up, um, you know, I guess it, I'm sorry, Andrew, you look like you had something you want uh, to say. Well, we didn't really get into uh, another idea that we had was culture jamming. Um, was that, uh, That's very true. Yeah, we want to talk about that a little bit. Um, I think Robbie has the best uh, description of it. Yeah, I, 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 I came to the idea of, of culture jamming uh, as a result of it's 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 kind of the the modern reaction to the 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 onslaught of 
advertising that that uh, we're subjected to, and um, it's an attempt by artists uh, to kind of undermine the message of the the advertisement and try to bring forth a little bit more more truth in advertising by uh, by altering the 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 image or the uh, the medium that the advertisement exists in, you know, and and that's kind of as a rule, it has to be that it has to it has to uh, be the same style of message, or it has to be a, yeah. an alteration, recognizable or a, as like yes. using the, their tools against yeah, them. Maybe, yeah, maybe yeah, for, basically, yeah, basically, like fighting fire with fire. Maybe yeah. for clarification's sake, when we're talking about culture jamming, uh, we're we're talking names you might be familiar with: Tim and Eric's awesome show, Great Job. Check it out with Dr. Steve Brühl. Uh, if you're on Amazon, the Info Channel. Um, a lot of this kind of, of kind of mocking society by using the the tools of that society. Like they're mocking advertisers by using the tools of the advertiser. Yeah, you know, an example, you know, drawn from uh, Tim and Eric is uh, they, they, there's a company that constantly comes up called Cinco, and and they sell the most yeah. deplorable useless products um and but but they, they they still have to sell them don't they and so they they you know through through every method through through customer testimonial through uh you know celebrity endorsements yeah. they they have these these phony commercials for for a phone whose whose battery only lasts for the duration of one call or or you know yeah. uh, a, a a glorified VCR that that uh, can only play one tape and you know so on and so forth these things that you have to be convinced you need and and that's at the heart of a lot of advertising is is something that you could really do without but but we're here to to prove to you that your life is incomplete without this product. I wonder right. how many advertisers are going to start mocking themselves. I mean, Geico to a certain extent is doing that on YouTube now. Where you you go to load a YouTube video and a Geico ad starts and they go, we're going to skip to the end of this ad so that you can get to your video faster. And then you get some sort of nonsensical, non sequitur end to it. I'm, I'm wondering if if these products are going to start using the culture jamming themselves to promote their item. I mean, I don't think, I don't think we're far away from that as it is right now. Uh, does anybody else have anything they want to add before we uh, call this one? No, but I like the idea of. Uh Companies latching onto or, 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 or um, cluing into the idea of customers' impatience, maybe this current generation's impatience, and so they're like, hey, you know what? We're going to give you a free pass to the end. But in a way, since they're playing the joke on themselves, they're making their ad more memorable because yeah, then that's... people can say, hey, you know, these companies are funny and being stupid, and it's just, it, you know, it's advertisement. There, there has been like a, a a really odd turn in just frankly surrealist humor in yeah, a lot yeah. of advertising. Old spice, old spice yes, yes old which, spice. which if I have to be subjected to ads, that's the kind of that's ad I want exactly. to be subjected to. Um, well, we've, we've talked a lot of it. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, the only thing I wanted to say is it might be a topic for another time, but uh, like there are a lot of parallel parallels to how uh, the corporate world's uh, control is viewed by culture jammers and the idea of like the illuminati yeah and new world order and those corporation sorts of owns that, us all which i wanted to kind of tie back to john carpenter's 1988 film they live <laughs> which is that same idea expounded on almost literal terms where there's yeah. an alien force who's come to earth and just uh, they have us under control by the same means that we use against our ourselves or that corporations use against us and i just like the idea of of those things intertwining so well but maybe we could talk about new world order and all yeah, that, that stuff you know sometime. that might be yeah, a really that, good idea really conspiracy fun. theories would but, be we may want to discuss that in in greater detail in a future episode jeremy would you have i was just going to add that consumerism and capitalism are not conspiracy you know it's not it's not fantasy it's real oh yeah there's, there's and, capitalism and, and when we do that episode where the david ike audience is going to come right along with us we're gonna we're gonna have all sorts of fun with, when we i get mean to that. i don't want david ike <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah advertising is is a necessary evil of a capitalist society and it it will always so, so long as as you know we we are a capitalist society it will exist and it's and it's it's kind of a, a, a self propagating 
thing. Um, you know, for instance, Coca Cola. Who who doesn't know Coca Cola? Every it's it's a worldwide brand. You you you'd struggle to find anybody in a developed country who doesn't know what Coca Cola is, but they still spend you know an enormous budget on advertising and and they're not thinking like well we're we're good everybody knows what coke is <laughs> the people who who have decided they've they like coke have figured it out by now we're we're good we can back off of advertising that's not true no if anything they're they're going to spend more and more and more as long as there's more people there's there's a bigger market that you can take a bite out of and so so advertising will be with us Till the end of time, <laughs> <laughs> you know? which, which is maybe so the, long, the, the overriding... as long as money is a thing, advertising will Unless be a thing. Unless Netflix takes over TV and Coca Cola takes over soda yeah. and water, then it, it would be one mega corporation. Yeah. And then suddenly we're in Blade Runner. Yeah, to, to, to bring it back to you know <laughs> Marty's Does Disney own everything kind anyway? of historical <laughs> point <laughs> about the uh, about the, the the guilds and uh, you know not being permitted to. Uh, to, to to stand out above the crowd, you know, as uh, only only like I think a truly socialist society could transcend advertising, you know, yeah. a utopian society. Yeah, <laughs> if we that's a that's a very good point. We're, we're, we're probably to... on the lip of a, of a deep black hole of yeah. of of the future of advertising. I I... So we're probably going to go ahead and call this one a a wrap. When we come back from this break, we've got one little bit of business to take care of, and uh, that will be it. So join us here in just a little bit. You're listening to Revolving Culture. It's some time in the future. The ultimate challenge. Crossfire. Crossfire. You get caught up in the crossfire. Crossfire. You get caught up in the crossfire. And we are back. Welcome back to Revolving Culture. Thank you so much for joining us today as we talk about advertising. And I thought maybe a good way to for us to close this out, we were discussing our favorite commercials. Um, and I think real quick, let's let's go around the table. If you've got a, a memorable commercial, I um, the one I can think of immediately off the top of my head is there was an old French's mustard commercial, and it was like. It, Real sandwiches, but they were kind of almost stop motioned into being anthropomorphic sandwiches. And it was sandwiches didn't like mayonnaise and didn't like all of these other substances, but they loved having French's mustard put on them. And I, the, the, the image that sits in my brain distinctly is a small sandwich with like two olives that they had pinned to the top that turned out to be eyes. And it, it becomes this like almost Japanese samurai thing is the the knife of mayonnaise is coming towards it and it's making these sort of vaguely Japanese sounds and it almost sounds like it's doing a karate move. It's the most bizarre thing, but this has been 20, 30 years ago that I've seen this. It still sits in my brain. I can remember laughing my butt off when you just get this little sandwich going, <laughs> Robbie, what about you? What was one of your favorites? Mine, mine isn't a, isn't a commercial. It was actually a a magazine ad. And what what fascinates me so much about it is is it's an example of of when advertising can can turn on the the advertiser and and you know decrease enthusiasm for the product. And uh, uh, how it came about was. Uh, um, the uh, developers of the original Doom game. Yes, I'm still talking about Doom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was uh, John Carmack and uh, John Romero, and uh, after they they made the uh, the first Doom game, uh, John Romero split from uh, the the developer to to start his own development company and uh, create his own game. And he's he's a blustering, you know, pr- proud person. And uh, <laughs> the the first advertisement. For the game, while it was in still in, de- in development, was a full page ad in a magazine that that just had big bolded letters that read, "John Romero will make you his bitch." <laughs> <laughs> and and <laughs> it was it was met with with you know b- befuddlement and <laughs> confusion and anger and and w- once the the product uh, the, the game uh, was called a daikatana and it's it's terrible it's it's awful and it didn't um, help that he's yeah. got that long flowing hair i mean yeah, he's, there was he's, a, reason he's a little why silly he was looking a penny yeah. arcade staple of 
of mockery for many years in the yeah. years of Penny Arcade. Yeah, but but that, that game was was lambasted and and you know is is long forgotten yeah. and and its its legacy is that ad and and to think you know that he, you know d- d- the damage control that could have been done by simply not no. putting out <laughs> no. that silly silly ad. Andrew, and that's, what about that's my you? Story. What do you got? Uh, beyond the uh, the commercial for. Uh, Crossfire, which expertly showed the intensity and brutality yep. of a game of Crossfire, Crossfire, and had one of the greatest songs of Crossfire. all time. I, <laughs> I point you to the YouTube video in which the band, the metal band Steel Panther, does yeah. their rendition of that theme song, <laughs> and it rocks the way a Crossfire theme should rock. Beyond that, that's one of my favorite commercials of all time. But um, uh, right before, uh, in, in 1996, right before Independence Day came out, they had a 30 minute spot on. On Fox, where they uh, did like a phone news, uh, breaking news mm-hmm. report of the aliens uh, Fox making was good contact. At that for a while, yeah. It was really good, and they, I think they also did a Blair Witch one. But both of those will stand uh, as some of the, as far as I'm concerned, like they grabbed me. Immediately. Yeah, they did it I went for, and the the second, the for the X Men: Days of Future Past. Fox was really good at that for a while. Yeah. These sort of faux documentaries that led you to. A week from now, going to the movie theater and, and checking out that film. Jeremy, what do you got on yours? Um, I'm just going to say the Life cereal commercial with Lil Mikey. Lil Mikey. He liked it. Yeah, so did he. <laughs> and that was the, you know, and that was, that was simplicity and message that stuck around for decades. I mean, we're, we're still in 2016. We can say Mikey likes it. I bet actors probably. 85 years old now I don't know I say that he was younger than me Life was my geek when I saw them but but that's that was such a simple message feed the here's the cereal who's going to try it cuz it doesn't give look it good Mikey. give it to Mikey he'll eat anything and Mikey likes it and <laughs> 35 years later we still know that Mikey likes him some life What's, cereal was the premise of life with Mikey with Michael J Fox about uh, No no that was really more just a, that was really more just a statement on on what happens to kid actors when they've they've no longer yeah. kid actors in twenty years? Oh, down and what about life with Michael Jackson? Uh, <laughs> that was <one's> episode. <laughs> Vicky, what about you? What's yours? Uh, do you guys remember? Did you guys go to Six Flags when you were kids? Of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah I remember Even that. In Oklahoma, we made the occasional trip. Yeah. <laughs> do you remember that old man? He used to get off the bus. Yeah, somebody's him. And dance. Oh god! <laughs> oh, the yeah, creepy bald, bald guy. Yeah, the weird Six bald dude. guy. Oh yeah. Did yeah. oh. <laughs> like techno music's playing and he's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I'd forgotten about. I Thank you too. for dredging yeah. that yeah. suppressed memory. That's the first more. time Vicky realized she could love a man. That's a. <laughs> Vicky will that's be an indelible image if ever there is. I actually remember hating that commercial. Just I think that's yeah. a commercial Seeing that, that just benefited like, from people. I mean, like, that was the point. Was you were supposed to go like... Nah. What's, the, what's but, the puppy monkey baby? Yeah. Puppy, puppy monkey baby. Puppy, puppy monkey baby. Puppy monkey baby, puppy monkey baby yeah. <laughs> we, what we will try and do is we're talking about these commercials. YouTube being what YouTube is. We're going to try. I, I, can, I can't imagine many of the commercials we've talked to in this last segment won't be available on YouTube where they are. Uh, visit our website because we're going to have those posted up there just as kind of an amusement. Uh, it's going to make my day if I find the French's Mustard commercial on YouTube. I'm going to tell you that right now. Yeah, if we missed anything, guys, uh, please let us know if you have other examples that we might have missed in, in a product placement in film. Yeah, let's, let's keep the uh, conversation going. Uh, just uh, let us know on the website. Yeah, you can visit us at revolvingculture.com. Uh, drop us a line on Facebook. We're at Revolving Culture Podcast on Facebook. Instagram and Twitter, we'd love to hear from you. We're at, at Rev Cult Podcast. And, and as always, give us the subscriptions and the reviews on iTunes. Let us know what you'd like to hear more of, what you'd like to hear less of, which probably means I'm out of a job. But uh, <laughs> certainly let us know what you think. We're, we're anxious to hear from you. We're anxious to, to help make this a, a, a sort of a collaborative effort between us and you. Do join us next time. We've got a lot more great topics to talk about. Uh, for the rest of the panel, I am Marty. Please join us again next time you have been listening to the Revolving Culture Podcast.